chair of the Harvard Global Health Catalyst Initiative, and he's going to talk a little bit about uh, about uh, the foundation of all of this. So, can you move to the next slide, please? Yeah. So, Professor Ahmed uh, is actually not currently here at Harvard. He's actually traveling, but he could not miss this opportunity uh, to be able to talk a little bit to the uh, course participants. So, Ahmed, are you there? Ahmed, can you hear us? Uh, I haven't uh, gotten a hold of him. It shows that he's here in the call. Uh, but I think he might be on mute or something like that. Okay. Um, if he's not able to, to join, I will say a little bit about uh, what he wanted to talk about. So basically, he he's, uh, he's wanted to talk a little bit about you know the win-win initiative that was started by that was started by by him, uh, and this win-win initiative basically is focused on making sure that we can develop. You know, collaborations that are, you know, everybody benefits from that, including um, education and training. Uh, and as part of that initiative, we launched uh, the Global Oncology University at Harvard this as uh, May. Actually, during the launch, we had uh, we are privileged to have Dr. Sumera who was there, uh, representing Shopakanum. And um, and the whole idea there is to be able to help to your human capacity. Um, you know, to strengthen the healthcare systems and make sure that cancer care uh, is delivered to the highest quality. And so we actually are looking forward to being able to work with uh, your center, the Shokokanums Memorial Cancer Center, uh, to be able to work with you as a partner in this initiative. And, uh, you know, as, as just one of the universities that the centers that have mentioned before. So I think that at this point, um, Ahmed cannot join us. I would like, uh, Lisa to talk a little bit about the course structure, and then uh, we will be able to introduce uh, the speaker, uh, the lecturer for today. Lisa, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Um, can you all hear me well? Perfect. Uh, Bill, can you give me a presenter so I can present my speech, please? Perfect. So, um, first of all, I would like to give you all um, a little overview about what the course is and what it entails. Uh, we have made this uh, document uh, where it talks about the duration, the requirements, the textbooks and the softwares, and all the guidance and scheduling that will be uh, along the way of this 13-week course. So just to give you a quick overview of um, uh, how we are going to get this started is we are going to train three sets of people. So there are, I know, physicians, medical physicists, and technicians. All of you guys are going to be trained in different, uh, according to different assignments that you to be uh, uh, going to be assigned after each course. So how the curriculum is designed is every Monday, you will a video to watch before the uh, before our meeting every Friday. That way, you, uh, that way, what will happen is uh, when you come into the course on Friday, it's going to be more of a discussion based. So there will be case studies that the professors will be discussing from Harvard Medical School, and it will, it will be a very interactive session where you will be able to ask questions and respond as we go ahead. Uh, we definitely want you to be prepared for before you come in so that you have a prior knowledge um, uh, so and you have the information required to answer your question and make it more useful and interaction. And so after that session as you guided, there will be an assignment that's going to be posted on the portal that I'll just go over with you right now or you'll be able to access it and then you'll be able to submit it. All the assignments will be due at the end of the course. So you can do it, uh, we recommend each week because there'll be all the knowledge will be there. Uh, but um, you could always, you always have time to uh, submit it by the end of the course. So to go over, uh, you'll be using some of these uh, software which we'll be introducing as we go ahead in the course and uh, we'll get you more familiarized with them. 
Um, so uh, uh, as you can see over here, this, uh, this course also basically states the lecture topics that we'll be covering, the attendants who will, who will be attending those uh, sessions. So if uh, you're a medical physicist or technician, you can see which sessions you will be attending and uh, the instructors uh, that will be giving it. You can also click on the uh, link for these instructors to see what their background is. And if you want to prepare some questions before the session for them, uh, we're more happy to address it. Uh, so this is a quick overview of uh, the entire session. Uh, there's going to be a holiday. I know there's a GAG, uh, session that's happening at Chakotanam on 1st of November. So there'll be a holiday then, and then we'll be uh, closing the, uh, uh, the session on the 8th of November. And all the assignments will also be due on the 8th then. So to give you an uh, overview now, um, going over this, uh, I'm, uh, I just wanted to know if all of you have gotten access to this platform. Uh, Bill was able to send you a username and password for the Global Health Catalyst Forum. So when you are able to log in, you'll be able to see a screen like this. Um, you'll be able to click on one of your courses that you're assigned to. Um, let me go ahead and you'll be able to see the entire course over here. But um, more than that, you'll be able to go in and see your assignments over here. So your assignments as we go ahead will be posted here and you'll be able to go click on them and progress with them. And then you'll also be able to track your progress right here of the assignments that you have completed. If you have any questions along the way, um, you're more than happy to shoot me or Bill or Farouk an email, and we're more than happy to help you uh, assist as we go along the course. So any questions regarding just the overview? OK. Great. Um, so I think that's all from my side, just to give you a quick overview of what the course will entail and uh, what are your expectations. If there's any questions along the process, I'm uh, more than happy to uh, address it and move ahead. So then I can give uh, a chance to the, one of the associate professors at Harvard Medical School, Zanuary Han, uh, to uh, begin the first uh, course session. Yeah, so I would like to say that uh... Zawi is actually one of the leaders of our SBRT program here at Harvard, uh, and we are very excited that you know he can, uh, you know, give his lecture. Uh, and as you go along, actually the schedule that Lisa just shared, you will see that uh, you know most of the faculty who are going to be teaching this class, uh, this course, are you know among the very best in the field in this area. So. Um, Without much ado, I will hand over to Zawi. Zawi, are you there? Yes, I am. Yeah, we're very grateful to you for, for coming to give this lecture. Over to you. Thank you. Can you, can you yeah. see my uh, screen? Yes, we can. OK. Just me thank you. They can. Uh, thank you, Will, and uh, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, so my lecture is an uh, introduction to the practice of SPRT. Uh, it is an overview, so the information you'll hear today will be very general. Uh, I think the site-specific SPRT will be covered in the subsequent lectures. So if you are interested in uh, a certain physics site, uh, you'll find those lectures very useful. Uh, so this lecture, I will somehow, uh, somewhat, hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Yes, we can. Yes, we can hear you. Great. Okay. So I was some, somewhat closely part of the AFP and CG101 report. And on the line, I'll provide some information and data about our practice, SBN practice here at Brigham. So here's the outline of, uh, of this, this lecture. First of all, we'll look at the uh, characteristics of SPRT and what makes it unique compared with other conventional uh, radiotherapy. I'll then talk a little bit about the rationale and the radiobiologic basis for, uh, for the practice of SPRT. 
And next, we'll go really briefly about the whole SPIT process uh, from immobilization simulation to human delivery. Uh, and we'll also look at a little bit about the, some of the uh, motion management uh, techniques and image guidance. And finally, some uh, basic aspects of SPIT, including spatial dosimetry uh, associated with the small field and QA. It looks like also there's a second lecture for QA, so I'm not going to uh, go details about QA, but uh, just uh, briefly mention some of the items. Uh, so what is SPIT? SPIT is a hyperfractionated treatment technique that delivers very large dose, uh, you know, small number of uh, fractions because this is a very aggressive delivery. So the biologically effective dose is very high. So in order to minimize the normal tissue toxicity, high complementary to the target, and also rapid dose fall off away from the target is critical for, uh, for SPRT. Uh, to quantify as SPRT, it needs to be less than five fractions, and the fraction size will also be greater than five gray. So SPIT therefore requires a high level of confidence in the accuracy of the entire process. This is of course accomplished by the integration of modern imaging, simulation, treatment planning, delivery technologies into all phases of the treatment process. So this table is taken uh, from TG101. Uh, as you can see, uh, for such a large dose delivered within uh, so few uh, fractions. Um, in order to minimize the normal tissue toxicity, so the PDV margin is usually very small on the order of millimeters uh, compared with the uh, uh, the standard uh, fractionation, which use margin of centimeters, uh, which in turn requires the high level of geometric and the limit of accuracy uh, and direct basic uh, involvement supervision is required. Multimodality imaging, uh, including MR, PET, uh, are usually used for better target and OLR delineation and for localization at the treatment. A robust immobilization uh, is used to ensure consistent patient setup and also to reduce patient motion during the treatment. Uh, spatial staff training is required for SBRT. And finally, SBRT is, uh, is poorly understood. So to be implemented in the clinic with abundance of caution. So why do we do SBRT? I mean, of course it works, right? So, the clinical outcomes of SPRT for both primary and metastatic diseases compare favorably to surgery with minimal adverse effects. Um, so this paper is uh, um, uh, compares SPRT with uh, which restriction, which restriction for stage one non small cell non cancer, and you can say uh, SPRT. Uh, improve the local control and regional control. I mean, surgery has better overall survival, but the uh, heart specific survival is basically identical uh, for both. So uh, the specific argument for the application of SPRT according to uh, TG101. Uh, first, SPRT maximizes local control, this is because chemotherapy and traditional fractionation are not as effective at eradicating site of growth disease with high chronogenic density. Uh, control of limited metastatic sites using SBRT may prevent evolution of disease beyond ability to control. Uh, use SBRT to reduce tumor burden to prevent or delay it from reaching a fatal limit. Uh, we also use SBRT for immunomodulation, which is a systemic uh, anti-tumor re uh, response, immune response, generated in certain conditions of radiation-induced tumor cell death. And finally, we can use uh, SBRT for uh, pineation. 
So PED and NPD concepts are uh, uh, commonly used to uh, for comparing uh, different fractionation schemes. And PED stands for biologically effective dose, which can be calculated using this formula uh, based on the assumption of alpha beta ratio. Uh, NPD is normalized total dose, which uh, is basically risky of the PED in terms of the well understood a uh, true great fraction scheme. Uh, so the formula is right here. And on this table, uh, it gives some of the uh, example alpha beta ratio for different tissues and tumor. So this paper is a retrospective analysis of 257 patients with stage one mass muscular lung cancer treated with hypofractionated uh, radiotherapy. So they, um, the authors compare uh, the the author compares uh, the local control and also survival uh, based on the achieved PED. As you can see, for PED greater than 100 gray, both the local control and survival are significantly better. Uh, so this table again compares the BED concept, the BED calculated for different fractionation. Uh, and you can see it's low for the conventional fractionation, but it's high, greater than 100 gray uh, for the normal I mean, common SBRT uh, fractionation. And you can see the estimate survival uh, uh, consequently is much higher for SBRT. Uh, this table is taken from TG101. It basically says the same thing uh, in terms of the NTD. So effectively, it points out that SPRT can achieve much higher PED or NTD, which is beneficial for, uh, for, for tumor control and the survival. So the disease sites that have been treated with this SPRT include but not limited to um, lung, liver, spine, pancreas, prostate, head and neck, heart, and breast. There are quite a few uh, systems on the market that have been used for SPRT treatment, including the regular stay on linac, uh, robotic linac, such as um, cybernite, and MR guided, uh, such as. Um, viewing, formal units, and also uh, proton system as well. But perhaps the, uh, the most versatile and widely used is the LINAC-based SPRT system. Typically, this system will have a high-definition MLC uh, for very good uh, dose uh, confirmation, uh, dose uh, beam confirmation. And also, uh, typical has a robotic couch, which has all six degrees of freedom. So you can do uh, both translational and uh, rotational correction, patient positioning. And it also, it, it is crucial as the system has a set of uh, uh, imaging systems, which can be used for, um, for imaging guidance, IGRD. Um, so on a regular uh, LINAC unit, we have a, a set of KV system and also MV uh, imaging system. So as we uh, mentioned, uh, target, uh, targeting accuracy is crucial for SBRT. So in order to, to achieve this high accuracy, some types of uh, robust uh, immobilization is is commonly used uh, in the practice of F SPRT. I mean, there are a few reasons for, for immobilization. First of all, we use immobilization to ensure consistent patient setup between uh, simulation and treatment, and also between fraction uh, fraction. We also use immobilization to uh, reduce patient uh, motion during the uh, during the treatment delivery, uh, which is into fractional motion management. Uh, and we also can use immobilization to assist motion management, 
um, for example, uh, which also is very commonly used, abdominal compression, which can be applied, applied to reduce the respiratory uh, motion. Again, there are quite a few uh, immobilization systems on the market, which has been demonstrated to be sufficient uh, for the purpose of uh, SBRT. Uh, in this picture, just two examples uh, here at Brigham we have used for uh, for SBRT. So on the top is the uh, uh, Electa body frame system, and the bottom is the uh, more recently uh, used a uh, Safeco system. Uh, and this system, as you can see, typically will have a platform, a rigid platform uh, that can be indexed to the swimming couch. Uh, and then all those immobilizing devices uh, can be indexed to the, to the frame, to the platform. And uh, so this immobilization uh, devices usually have, uh, say for example, vacuum bag, uh, which when um, deflated can uh, become rigid and conforms to the body, uh, to the patient body contour. Uh, this system may or may not have, uh, say for example, foot support, knee support, and a set of compressions, which can use to uh, use for uh, motion management. Uh, I mean, the, the, the whole goal of demobilization, first of all, is to uh, to achieve the good immobilization, prevent patient from, you know, uh, move. Also, it needs to be relatively comfortable to the patient. Otherwise, patient will tend to move during treatment uh, because the SPRT treatment tends to be quite long, uh, can be up to 30 or 40 minutes or even longer uh, when you take uh, also the time for, uh, for setup into consideration. So this paper uh, is taken from uh, PG 101, which shows the historical historical data, uh, accuracy, uh, in terms of accuracy of the different immobilization devices. And you can see uh, a lot of devices have been studied, applied for different type of uh, diseases. And the, overall, the, the accuracy, achieved accuracy is within a, a few millimeters. This is a, uh, one example uh, we have here at the Brigham. So this immobilization device is, is actually homemade, which is very similar to the Electa body frame. And you can see it has a, has a shell, has a three side shell, so the patient can be uh, can be put in uh, in a in a shell with a vacuum bag. Uh, so our experience uh, on this on this immobilization system um, for uh, like three D error of one point five millimeters, like one hundred percent of the cases, as if you look at here, so one hundred percent of the cases achieve a three D error of one point five or one point five millimeters or better. After, right after the localization image. If you take into account consideration the uh, intrafractional motion, we still have 95% 90, of the cases has a 3D error of 1.5 millimeter or better. So it's quite robust. So, of course, it is uh, um, important in terms of documentation and communication. So all those immobilization parameters uh, have to be properly documented and communicated to the treatment team. So the patient can be set up exactly as uh, at, the, at the simulation to, to basically ensure the patient will be treated exactly as, as a CT scan. So simulation imaging. Simulation uh, is used to provide visualization of the patient anatomy in the treatment position, ideally. So this uh, visualization, this image will be used for target and OAR delineation for treatment planning and uh, used for uh, imaging guidance and treatment delivery. CD is the primary image modality for SBRT and forms the basis for those calculations because it provides a uh, needed function unit. 
and electron density. So the length of scan of the CT needs to be adequate, first of all, to allow non coplanar uh, field. So basically, the, the scan length should be extended beyond the region of interest by uh, by certain uh, distance in a certain direction. And also, it should be adequate to include the OER for those volume histogram evaluation. This is particularly uh, important, for example, in the case of non sprd some of the non-metrics were given uh, are given in terms of the uh, percentage of non-volume. So you, in order to get the meaningful percentage of non-volume, you have to scan the whole length of the non. You have to include the entire line uh, in the CT scan. Otherwise, uh, you couldn't get the uh, uh, the metrics uh, actually. Uh, appropriate slice thickness should be used. Uh, for example, 2.5 millimeter slice thickness might be adequate for lung and GI, but it might not be adequate for for spine or brain. Uh, in that sense, uh, here at uh, at Brigham, we use one millimeter for spine and thinness cases. MRI and PET are often used to assist visualization. Here, just one example showing the uh, application of MRI. Uh, so on the left side, you can see this is we use MRI to help visualizing the brain tumor uh, for uh, brain radio surgery. On the right, again, we use MR to help visualize the spinal cord for spine SPRT. And both in both cases, if you look at the uh, CT scan, uh, the tumor, the brain tumor and spinal cord is quite difficult to, to see. Uh, tumor motion. As a primary source of organ or tumor motion includes respiration, this can be up to 5 cm, uh, cardiac function, uh, peristaltic activity, organ failing, and emptying. Example of uh, respiratory motion. First of all, respiratory, uh, respiratory motion is very complex, and the tumor motion predominantly occurs in the soup in direction, and you can see by uh, by the trace. Uh, the trajectory has hysteresis. Motion tends to be greater for lower lobe than upper lobe tumors. Uh, even 65 of the old patients has a motion amplitude less than 1 cm, but as we just mentioned, for some cases, uh, as much as uh, 5 cm has been reported. So uh, you have to be careful when treating this type of tumor because if not careful, it could move out, the tumor could be uh, moving out of the uh, field and so we just really a normal tissue. So it's very important to have certain means of motion management in the, uh, in the implementation of SPRT. Uh, so AAPM 76 describes various tumor motion management techniques. This including gating, cracking, active breathing hold, uh, breathing control, breath hold, uh, snow safety uh, to, to capture the average uh, motion of, of the tumor and also using 40 CT, 40 MR and 40 PET. So 40 CT is very commonly used for motion management. So during the during the 40 uh, CT scan, patient breathing uh, is monitored. So you can say this is a breathing trace which derived from some type of, uh, of method that monitoring the, uh, the patient breathing. So this system can be, the monitor could be provided, for example, by a optical marker, which is placed on the patient's chest or abdomen and use that as a surrogate for the patient uh, breathing. Uh, so multiple study data sets are reconstructed. Each set is associated with the uh, respiratory phase. 
uh, the most commonly, I mean, actually, in the, at the vacant, we, we can't normally use like 10 phases. So basically, during the 40th scan, 10 phases of, uh, of CD data set, 10 set data set will be reconstructed. Reconstructed. Each data set is associated with a certain breathing phase. Then when you play these 10 phases in a loop as a movie, which represents the, the model of organ motion, uh, which is demonstrated on the on the right in the movie, and you can see this is how the ten phases are are played, and you can see uh, the the tumor the target is moving in like all three directions. Uh, so once you have the uh, forty theta set, uh, we can either design and deliver a tumor plan on a certain phases for a creative fashion. Or we can use another method just to add a safety margin to include the motion in the treatment volume. For example, in this case, the treatment volume, which is comfortable here, includes the entire range of tumor motion. So target definition in the presence of motion uh, is uh, a final uh, definition of uh, ICIU reports uh, 62 and 83. So in the case of SPRT, uh, CTV and GTV are often considered uh, to be identical. So on top of that, we um, we add the ITV, we consider the ITV uh, to, again, to include the entire range of motion. This contour can be assisted by the face images when, when played as a movie, so it's uh, sometimes called cine images, and can be assisted by the maximum intensity projection, which is very widely used for lung cancer, lung tumor, and or minimum intensity projection, which is commonly used for liver and uh, liver counter. So, for example, here is the uh, tumor motion in the lung. And this use maximum intensive projection. Um, so once you have the ITV, which includes the motion, then another margin is added to ITV to TTV. Uh, so that will be treatment, the whole treatment volume. So commonly we use five minutes to one cm for lung and GI cases. Uh, so the treatment plan is actually calculated on the average intensity projection data set. Uh, for example, uh, you can say uh, this is the same patient on the right, uh, the difference between maximum uh, intensive projection and average intensive projection. So the reason for this average uh, intensity projection is it represents the average PTV position. This is important for those calculations and also it correlates better with the comb city at the time of patient treatment. Uh, this is important because when we uh, set up the patient at the treatment machine, we look at both comb city and the city, the planning city. So ideally, they should be uh, somehow similar. So that's the reason average in, in of, uh, intensity projection tends to be much better matching better with the compensated, which is against the uh, like slow city, essentially. So SDRT, those prescriptions. Conventional treatment uh, is based on the delivery of uniform dose to the target. Therefore, the hotspot is limited, is limited to like 110 to 120%, uh, which is illustrated on this, uh, on the right. For SPRT, it's more important to achieve very high dose conformity to the target and also to, to achieve very sharp dose fall up outside the target to spare the, uh, the organs, normal organs. So for that reason, uh, SPRT is only prescribed to a lower isodose level, isodose line, uh, typically to 70 to 80% uh, to take advantage of the high high dose gradient. If you look at the right, that's what I'm talking about. So because of that, the hotspot in in the case of HVIT unit pretty high, up to 150%. However, the hotspot in HVIT 
is often considered acceptable and even clinically desirable because uh, it helps to kill the uh, hypoxic tumor cells within the target, which is usually radio resistant. So historically, uh, SPRT started with 3D conformal radiation therapy, uh, typically seven to 12 uh, non-coplanar beams are used to, to achieve sharp and isotropic dose fall up away from the target and also to achieve high dose conformity to the target. Uh, nowadays, uh, volumetric uh, arc therapy is more commonly used. Uh, typically, we use multiple arcs to, uh, again, to achieve uh, uh, the, the goal. Lower energy is preferred. This is because the lower the energy, uh, for example, second or tenant the shorter uh, the shorter the uh, electron range. That is that helps uh, reduce the uh, penumbra for small fields, and also this is beneficial for low density medium such as lung cases. Uh, it found out the company used five millimeter MRC uh, leaf wave is adequate as uh, it is important to have a calculation algorithm that is capable of heterogeneity correction. Uh, so the calculation uh, grade is also important. Uh, a calculation grade of two millimeter or finer is recommended uh, to ensure the spatial dose accuracy. Uh, we use one millimeter at, uh, uh, in our hospital. Uh, normal tissue dose tolerance in SPRT, we know uh, normal tissue dose limit for SPRT are very different from the conventional radiation therapy. Um, so direct e extrapolation from conventional radiotherapy is inappropriate for the uh, implementation of SPRT. Uh, particular attention should be applied uh, to the following video biological factors when uh, when dealing with SPRT, the fractional size, the total dose, the time between fractions, and the overall treatment time. So uh, PG101 actually gives some example uh, taken from U University of Texas Southwestern and the University of Virginia. Um, so they divide this uh, normal tissue tolerance into perineal tissue and serial tissue. Uh, so this might use the perineal tissue and it is separated by different fractionation. Again, this was serial tissue uh, separated by, by different fractionation schemes. Again, those are taken from TG101. So SPRT is typically very complex and uh, so it is critical to uh, accurately communicate the details of the treatment plan and its execution to the treatment team. Uh, combinations of uh, DVH and tables can be used to evaluate the plan. Uh, so the metrics reported according to TG101 and also uh, our practice include uh, prescription dose, prescription to ICIU reference point, or those volume, uh, number of treatment fractions, total target delivery period, target coverage, plant conformity, conformity. those four up outside of the target, heterogeneity index, those to organ, to organs at risk. Uh, for example, in our institute, in our hospital, we uh, use these tables to, to communicate, to report the uh, uh, achieved uh, matrix. Uh, localization. So image guidance is essential to, to the practice of uh, SPRT because it provides the highest level of uh, accuracy in terms of lo localization and the verification. Uh, so uh, IGRT includes 
all kinds of uh, images. It can be X-ray based ultrasound or optical imaging, and also it can be categorized as 2D localization, 3D localization, and uh, more recently surface imaging. Uh, for 2D localization, we, which we can commonly use, for example, the MV portal imaging on the regular NINAC and the KV radiography. Uh, 3D localization includes MV, KV, Combin CD, uh, Inval CD, maybe on real uh, MRI, ultrasound, and uh, other modalities. So here I example of the um, some of the 2D imaging. This again can be gantry mounted OBI system. It's called uh, onboard imaging system, uh, and you can commonly see it on the regular neck. And it can be room mounted KV system. For example, uh, Winlab is exact track. It has two uh, extra sources on, in the floor and two images. Uh, Mounted on the on the ceiling, uh, and the cyber knife uh, imaging system is very similar to uh, to the uh, brain lab exact track, except to swap the uh, the location of the source and detect it. Um, so two D imaging are very good. Images are very good for bony and judicial matching to DR. Um, the most commonly, uh, you know, commonly used uh, 3D imaging system, I think, is uh, currently uh, is the Combin CD that is gantry mounted on um, a regular neck. Uh, so Combin CD is a volumetric imaging. It allows for complete translational and rotational patient uh, uh, assessment and adjustment, and it provides better greater vis visualization of organs uh, relative to, to PDV. So it is very, uh, uh, has very high precision. Uh, optical surface imaging has been increasingly used to help visualization, uh, localization. Uh, it is real time and it's very, also very convenient to use. So, a lot of time we also use it for uh, for patient monitoring, during radiation delivery, uh, for intrafractional motion management. And again, also it's 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 not uh, it doesn't have X-ray, so it doesn't have the uh, uh, X-ray dose concern. So. After localization, I mean, also I, I would like to point out in a in a specific clinic, including ours, uh, it is not like you are using only one type of imaging for localization with or uh, verification. It usually is a combination of 2D, 3D, and surface imaging to achieve the highest uh, localization accuracy. So in our case, for example, we started with optical imaging, drive the patient. To the uh, to the rough location, then use the 2D uh, image localization based on the bony uh, alignment. Then we use Combin CD uh, for 3D fine adjustment based on soft tissue. Uh, so all in all, it's like combination of all those image modalities. Uh, the goal is just, just to achieve the highest confidence in the uh, in the uh, localization accuracy. So once the patient uh, is set up uh, after localization during the beam on time during the radiation delivery, it is also desirable to have some some type of the uh, monitoring and just ensure the patient stays uh, uh, in the position and the fact is still within the uh, uh, within the uh, the the PDV. So again. Uh, a field system can be used for interfractional monitoring, the optical surface imaging we just mentioned. Um, we can also use MV portal imaging, for example, this is like uh, the example of using MV portal imaging. 
this was taken in our hospital when we're still using 3D, uh, 3D conformal uh, technique for, for non SPRT. Uh, and you can see the motion of the tumor uh, during the radiation arm uh, stays within the, uh, the field boundary, which is good, which is assuring, uh, because we know that we are treating the tumor, but not irradiating the normal tissue. Uh, nowadays, uh, since we moved to uh, MRT and we might uh, error, uh, it will be more difficult to use the MV photo imaging to monitor the, uh, the tumor motion. Uh, so now in our hospital, it is more com commonly used, it's called this KV uh, imaging. The KV radiography can be triggered at a certain time interval uh, for example, five seconds, every five seconds during the uh, radiation delivery, uh, it can be done even when, when we use arc therapy. Um, so this is one example of the triggered imaging. Uh, it's a KV radiography again. Uh, this is particularly uh, beneficial if uh, if the patient uh, has in, implant uh, fiducial. And also, we have an algorithm to do uh, automatic fiducial detection. Uh, for example, in this case, you can say uh, four in, uh, fiducials were implanted in the patient, and uh, three are detected and within the PTV counter. Uh, the other one, the fourth one, is just outside of the, the PTV. Uh, I mean, this this measures we use, for example, in this case, even we have like three brain, which means it's good, detected, first of all, the, the uh, fiducial, and then it, uh, they are all within the, uh, the the PDV margin. But if you look at the uh, location, all three, all, I mean, all four are on the inferior part of the uh, PDV, which may warrant uh, adjustment of patient. Um, we saw this often, and we 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 can if this happens, we only stop the beam, take another 2D verification or 3D uh, cone beam, just to make sure uh, the fiducial is still centered in the uh, in the tumor field. Um, so, which is uh, I mean, this is basically uh, very helpful in terms of also workflow because we don't have to uh, like using intra intra I mean. Intrafraction cone beam CD between us, we can just take advantage of the triggered imaging to monitor in the, uh, the treatment. Uh, and finally, um, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, small field dosimetry. Uh, we know measurement, measurement of small photon beam is very complicated. Uh, but the loss of electron equilibrium, so a stack detector of very small uh, active volume is desirable, is required. Uh, but many, many times, oftentimes, has to be less than, uh, smaller than one millimeter. And also, we have to carefully set up the phantom detector um, uh, in order to do an uh, actual measurement. Uh, another issue associated with this small field is also because nowadays uh, MRT uh, more and more applied to uh, to SBRT or radio surgery. Uh, so historically, when we're doing the commissioning, for example, the basic uh, beam data, for example, uh, um, this output factor, the total scatter factor, uh, was measured under the collimation of jaws. Uh, so if you, you you look at the output factor as a function of the field size, which again, collimated by the jaws, is a single line. Uh, usually the larger the field size, the jaw size, the, the, the bigger the, the scatter factor. But when you also include in the MRC, so the combined contribution from both MRC and jaws will complicate the situation. Uh, in this situation, if you look at this, uh, all data, all measurement uh, on our machine, uh, you no longer have a single line, uh, just as you would see from a 
job coordination only. Uh, now you have all those branches uh, to reflect the combined uh, conservation from the MSA and JAWS. Uh, so you are not dealing with uh, one dimensional uh, data, you are dealing with uh, two dimensional data basically. And uh, this has to be very careful, it's particularly for small fields. If not, you end up having uh, very large uh, uh, those errors in the in the calculation. Another issue we found also very important is the 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 metric accuracy of the treatment planning system is sensitive to the MLC parameters. Uh, so it, you you guys probably already uh, know, like say for variant eclipse system. Uh, the planning system requires us to input uh, certain uh, the metric uh, parameters for the to model the MLC. The most commonly uh, user-defined uh, transmission factor and the metric deep gap, deep gap DLG, uh, and turns out the sensitivity, to those accuracy, sensitivity to to those parameters parameters is also the field size dependent. Uh, for example, in this case, if we change the DLG, the submission lip gap from 1.4 millimeters to 0.3 millimeters, for reasonable notch uh, targets, uh, the dose error is still within a few percent, say plus minus two or three percent. But if you look at the uh, uh, small field, like small target, it is dramatic. The, the dose area can be as high as like 25% uh, for the smallest uh, target we we analyze. And the change also is dramatic, like up to 20% change uh, when, when you have only a, a small change in the MLC parameters. And again, this change is not uniform across the, uh, the field size, in the field size dependent. It might be okay. It's a small change for large field size, but you will be dramatically change for small uh, small field size. So that's something we also need to be very careful. Um, uh, so finally, quantity assurance. Um, so because the 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 highest. Uh, uh, confidence requirement for for SBRT. So QA is needed, is required for all aspects of the system, both individually and uh, collectively in an integrated fashion. Uh, again, because we'll have a separate lecture about quantity of strength. So I will um, not go into these details, but just uh, quickly mention all those items that need, need to be uh, QA. Uh, this includes, but not limited to, integrity of the simulation imaging data, those calcul calculation algorithms, MLC and leaf sequencing, MU calculation algorithms, leaf speed, version dose rate for SPRT. Um, the reason will be because now nowadays like the uh, the modern Lina can have different dose rates because SPRT unit because it will deliver a uh, large uh, large dose where, uh, also the prescribed uh, prescription is high so the number of MU uh, tends to be very large for SPRT type of uh, plan and if we use normal dose rate the treatment time will be very long. And the longer the longer time, the more likely the patient will, will move and it will cause geometric or dosimetric error. So it's desirable to use higher dose rate. Uh, so on the machine, for example, uh, the very machine, tubing machine, uh, if we use uh, high dose rate, six MV beams, it can be much, much higher than the regular uh, dose rate for, for like other type of treatment. Uh, but for us, we'll have to be um, careful because of the the different dose rate. We want to make sure uh, the calibration at that high dose rate is accurate as well. 
so on the one hand, we want to shorten the treatment time to ensure the accuracy. But on the other hand, we don't want to artificially introduce any dosimetry uh, error because of the calibration, especially with a higher uh, dose rate. Uh, patient positioning and localization, uh, this in both including the imaging system and also the uh, the robotic couch. Remember, we are using uh, we are driving patients to the uh, two locations to ensure the accuracy of, of both systems. Uh, motion tracking and gating if uh, they are used in the clinic. Uh, so some reference. Task group reports and guidelines include teach 40, 42, 45, 53, 74, 76, 142. I mean, those uh, units deal with a certain aspect of the uh, of the um, of the treatment process. It's either motion QA, uh, treatment planning QA, uh, motion management, or like auto factor that type of thing for. So, uh, You'll find this very really, uh, useful. <clears throat> uh, particularly important to SPID is to verify uh, the radiation isocenter coincides with the uh, mechanical isocenter or imaging isocenter. This commonly done is the so-called Winston knot test. You you set up a very really opaque sphere, for example, by uh, laser to the uh, or images to the me mechanical isocenter or image isocenter, then you irradiate use a small field, which represents the radiation field, and you sort of compare the field center and the uh, really opaque uh, uh, object center. That would tell you what is the tolerance, what is the difference between these two isocenters. Uh, again, this is very important because um, uh, because the treatment volume for stochastic cases tends to be small. Uh, it can be only uh, a few minute, minutes in the case of video surgery. Even a small uh, deviation between these two isocenters can cause a geometric uh, miss. So, uh, again, some reference for guidelines and protocols for, for the implement. Uh, implementation and the practice of SPRT, um, APM TG101, which we, we found a relatively closely in this lecture. Uh, it will be very useful for the practice guideline for SPRT. Uh, there's also ACR astro practice parameter for the performance of stereotactic body radiation therapy. Uh, it talks about uh, a lot of aspects of the, uh, of the uh, practice. Like qualification and responsibility of personnel, and uh, specifications of the procedure, documentation, quality control and improvement, safety, and uh, even the uh, SPRT uh, process. You'll find those uh, reference materials very useful uh, for your clinic uh, practice. Uh, I think uh, that. That's it. Uh, that is my uh, all of my uh, my. Uh, just feel free to ask questions if you have any. And thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? Are we are we going to have these slides on the uh, electronic portal as well? I don't know. I think with Will. Yes. Uh, I can give yes. uh, the slides to him so he can put uh, wherever is appropriate for you guys to to look at. Yes, I can give it to Will and uh, and let him deal with it. Yes. Good? Can you hear me? This is Will. Yes. Thanks, Will. Yeah. Yes. Hi. So yeah, we, we, we actually have them online already. I think uh, uh, Bill Swanson is already up, uploading them. And uh, there will also be a chance there to even ask follow-up questions. Uh, like Zawi mentioned, uh, this is kind of like an intro overview. 
from next week, we should have more site specific um, um, lectures. So basically, and discuss more deeply into case studies and you know the kind of uh, things that will really be directly applicable. And then uh, uh, later on, we we'll also talk about the commissioning and all of that stuff. So we encourage everybody to kind of go on the platform and see the syllabus there, and also the lecture that Zawi just gave will be put up there. Yes, sure. I think we'll go back and read it. I think we need to go back. <laughs> just just a small thing. I think the text is too small and it's like uh, the font color. But I think we'll have the slides from next time onwards. So the interactive session will be case case based anyways. So next from next onward, next time onwards, we'll have these slides online. Is that right, Will? Yes, absolutely. So you're going to have yes. the slides. And also these ones, these ones will be posted online as well. Yeah, that will be great. Yeah. That will be great. Where do you want me to send you uh, this slide by email? Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah I, I okay. sent you an email. Uh, you can uh, reply back and just forward those slides to me. I can upload them to the site. I do. Thank you. Yes, thank you. That will be great. Uh, I have a question for 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 you guys. Um, yes. So, when do you plan to start your SBRT program? So, I think I'll give it to Rafe, who's the chief physicist, who will be able to answer this question. Uh, Rafe. So, uh, hopefully, in the first quarter of 2020, um, uh -huh. our machine is uh, at the moment. Uh, we are waiting for our equipment, and hopefully, that will be installed by the end of this year and the commissioning stuff and all other protocol finalization things. So probably in the first quarter of 2020. Okay. Do you have particular patient site uh, indications that you're going to focus on? Is it going to be yes, we uh, are, all the sites we, that uh, Zawi mentioned? We, we are focusing on lung, brain, uh -huh. liver, and probably bone metastasis. Okay, great. So actually, the lecture next week will also will be on lung. In particular, so David Cozono, uh, professor here, is going to give that lecture. So, okay, so it's good to know. Absolutely. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah. One more thing that uh, we are thinking to have something very focused on SPRT uh, treatment delivery uh, according to our equipment. We are uh, getting this variant tubing H, a new accelerator. So okay. our focus will be 4D gated CVCT, a marker match, uh, optical camera matching, uh, RGS matching, uh, and typically regarding the stuff we are getting. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Zawi, uh, is that what we have? Uh, we have are we using that our true beam for SBRT currently? Right, right. We have two edge machines in our clinic. As I mentioned, yes, we uh, we the same. We use all three types of image modalities for, for patient setup, interfractional uh, monitoring. It works out very well. And I I think I mean lung liver does uh, it's it's uh, easier compared with uh, spine SPRT to start with. So that's a good uh, plan. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, so if there's any particular specific questions that uh, you have about implementation for, you know, for the very end, I think uh, we have the, the, the expertise here to be able to help with that. Are, are you already done with the commissioning? Um, so, so can you see? No, 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 not yet. The machine is not yet here, so uh, that will be installed in, in next couple of months and hopefully then Okay, commissioning by the end of this year. Okay. Yeah, because one of the lectures uh, is also going to be focused on that. And I think, you know, uh, you know, we'll have uh, the opportunity also to ask further questions. I hope that will be helpful in, in your plan to be able to start up that commissioning and start the program. That's great. One more thing that yeah. we are getting this uh, Calypso uh, um, beacon points for different sites. So, our clinicians will be interested in, in this kind of stuff as well. So if there is someone who can let us know their uh, institutional protocols 
or the procedure is yeah. in the guideline. All right. Yeah, we're going to talk to, we're going to let all the lecturers who are coming up to discuss that, you know, like for the long case next week, uh, have okay. uh, Professor David talk about that, you know, so that, uh, and I think that, you know, if uh, at some point you feel like you need some, somebody to come and visit there and do that, you know, we can also plan that out, you know, so that you can have more direct uh, conversations. Hmm, that would be great. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Yes. That was a great lecture. So, uh, and, so yeah, go well, ahead. thank you. So finally, you I think. Dr. Yeah. Sunara, you were saying something? Yes, finally, I think we are done with the first lecture. So yeah. hopefully the activity will keep on going smoothly and we will have the uh, flow of information and you will have interaction and full participation from our side as well. Uh, thank you so much to the Global Health Catalyst team. And I think we really look forward to this uh, good clinical activity and educational activity. And it is very helpful for all of us. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Samara and everybody over there. And I hope to see you next Friday. Yes. And we'll be Thank expecting you. an online lecture on Monday. Yes. Uh, we'll post, there'll be some videos online on Monday. And then, uh, you know, and then you should also have uh, then follow up. Of the, you actually discussed that on, on Friday during the lecture itself on Friday morning. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That will be good. And all this material that Zawi presented will also be available online alongside with the TG report that he discussed. Yes. They're all asking. We are not going to be tested immediately uh, for this model. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> <They're> um, all... <laughs> yeah. We did send a pre-evaluation survey uh, basically it's it's just you know to kind of measure where things are and it's anonymous so if people like to take that survey they can do that well, it should also give you an already. yeah everybody it should give you an appreciation of you know where things are a little bit uh but yeah i mean i think only at the end of the class and i think that if there are questions particularly uh end of the course i mean there are questions during the lectures and i think from next week also with the case specific uh discussions that you have um, most of the, the experts here are very eager, you know, to, to, to help with that. So, and like I mentioned, we can actually plan a visit there as well before you guys start your program, you know, just to get this launch off uh, the most, the best possible way. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Samara. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bill. Thank and, you. Um, yes. Thank you, everybody. Next... Have a good weekend. Yes, bye. Yes. Bye. See you next week. Bye. Right. Thank you so much for the nice lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Yes. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Bill, for organizing. <laughs> of course. Thanks. Thank you.